Someone's always watching me. Someone's always there, and I'm sleeping. <laughs> Before we delve into the darkness, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share all of our videos on the Warren Files. And don't forget to click on the bell so you can hear about our upcoming videos. Hi, and welcome to the Warren Files. I'm your host, Chris McKinnell. Forget what you've seen in the movie The Haunting in Connecticut, or it read in my grandparents' book In a Dark Place. This is the true account of the Snedeker's terrifying encounter with an incubus and a succubus in a former funeral home in Southington, Connecticut, and the nine and a half weeks I spent combating these evil entities. Before we get started, please remember to like and subscribe to our channel and click on the bell so you'll find out about our upcoming videos. The Snedekers, Carmen and her husband Al, and their four children, Phil, Brad, Jennifer, and AJ, along with Carmen's 18-year-old niece, uh, Tammy, all lived in Monticello, New York. Unfortunately, in 1986, um, Phil was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, and his mother had to take him from Monticello all the way down to Farmington, Connecticut, many hours drive to the University of Connecticut um, Medical Center. And it was far too taxing for poor Phil, especially after going through radiation treatments. So she scrambled to find a place to stay. And luckily, she did find a place in Southington. What she didn't realize was that it was a funeral home. When she was in there the first day and looking at it, she was just desperate to find a place to go. And there were workers down in the basement. There was lumber all over the place. So she didn't see what was really down there. But after they moved in, it was completely evident. There was the drainage pit where the fluids were released from the bodies and poured into a underground vat. There was the chain hoist that lifted the coffins from the basement up to the uh, master bedroom. There was an embalming table still there and grave markers. There was even a, bl a giant blood stain on one of the walls. There were unbelievably even embalming chemicals still left there. How do you rent a place with all of this st stuff still left there? I, I just couldn't understand that to save my life. But Unfortunately, because they had maxed out all of their finances to get the place, they had no money to leave and go anywhere else. So they felt pretty stuck there. Now, Carmen and Al didn't believe in ghosts, so to them, it was not a big deal. They, they couldn't believe anybody would believe in ghosts, to be quite honest. But Phil and his brother Brad both wanted to stay downstairs in the basement. So they turned it into a bedroom right next to the embalming room in the coffin room where the coffins were displayed. And then Philip started to see different entities appearing to him. He saw an old man in a pinstripe suit. He saw a young man with long dark hair. And probably the most creepy one to me he saw a little boy in a Superman set of pajamas. Now, his family thought that this must just be a side effect of his radiation treatments and kind of wrote it off. They talked to the doctors about it, of course. But then he started to have personality changes. He started to become very, very morose, very depressed, angry, violent. He wanted to paint the bedroom all in black. He only wanted to wear black. And most chilling of all, he was planning how to kill his stepfather, Al. 
They took him to a psychiatrist and he was diagnosed as schizophrenic and he was sent to an institution where he could both be treated for his cancer and treated for his supposed schizophrenia. Unfortunately, things didn't end there. After Phil was sent to the hospital, it started to focus on Tammy, the 18-year-old niece. She describes how one night she was in bed and she felt this hand lift up the blanket at her feet and then she could feel a cold hand sliding up her body and up her back and how terrified she was and she screamed and she grabbed her rosary beads and she started to pray and the rosary beads broke right in her hand. Again, Carmen and Al didn't believe any of this. They just thought, oh, these stories that uh, Philip was telling and now it's being spread around and Tammy's getting to think of these things, it's ridiculous. Unfortunately, then, while Tammy was with Carmen, she came under attack and Carmen clearly saw what looked like a hand coming up Tammy's, the front of Tammy's shirt. She could see the knuckles, she could see the wrist outline, she could see that it was grabbing her. They knew immediately that there was something real here. It was four o'clock in the morning and they called the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church said, pray, just pray, it'll go away. Of course, it didn't just go away. It then started to attack Carmen sexually and physically. It became horrifying. Al would wake up every single night hearing an old Victrola playing in the house and hearing 1930s style music. And he'd walk through the whole house looking for this music and it was nowhere. He was in the basement with the boys looking around. He couldn't find the source of this. He was becoming truly terrified. He started carrying around a baseball bat at night and, and stalking the halls. Eventually, he actually got out his gun and he was walking around with his gun. And that's when he got more afraid that he was going to end up shooting one of his kids if he went around a corner and the child was sit, standing there in the hallway because he was that terrified. At that point, they knew they needed help. And they heard about Ed and Lorraine Warren and they called them. My grandparents decided to send myself, my partner Ray Jefferson, and John Zaffis into the house. This was John's first case with us. And I spent the next nine and a half weeks in that house every single night except for one. One night, Brad was alone in the basement and he was hearing voices and he saw his sister Jennifer come down the stairs and started playing with the light switch and the lights were going on and off, on and off, on and off. The thing that made that really spooky, there were no light bulbs in those fixtures. The lights were going on and off without lights. And he heard her giggling and then run up the stairs and he called out to her and then he chased after her. And when he got to the top of the stairs, his parents said, what's going on? Why are you running up here? He says, did you see Jennifer? She was just down in the basement. And they said, no, she's been asleep for hours. And they checked and of course she was sound asleep. It wasn't Jennifer, it was a doppelganger. These things resort to something called diabolical confusion. It upsets you, it throws you off balance, and you don't know what to trust, and you become even more terrified. So in June 1988, they had been in the house almost two years, we arrived. And I even saw one night when I was there, that same manifestation of a dark cloud that then materialized into that old man with the pinstripe suit. I saw this myself. The attacks intensified and at one point the incubus, which is a demonic entity that attacks women sexually, 
actually said to her that it wanted to play, it wanted to get in bed with its two favorite playthings, Carmen and Tammy. It would pull her down into this horrible abyss. And as you can see in the photo here, it could happen anywhere. Here I am with her in the kitchen and she is actually, God help us, being raped and sodomized while we are trying everything we can to pull her out of this. And this happened almost every single night, sometimes several times a night. The family was being worn down horribly. And after one of these times when Carmen was drawn down deep into this, this darkness, that, as she described it, she, she created a, a picture and she gave it to me. This happened in the bedroom. Uh, she was attacked that one night. And as you can see, she feels surrounded by these black entities all around her. And that's what she had to deal with all the time. But there were actually moments of grace mixed in with these moments of terror. We would pray to Padre Pio, and the whole house would smell like roses. And for a while, there would be peace. But then it would turn to the smell of rotting meat, which is really, sad to say, a cliche in hauntings. These things happen all the time, and it always seems to be either a sulfur smell or a smell of rotting meat. The kind of thing that just makes you want to get sick. And the oppressive feelings that we would all feel, this heaviness that would come over you and, and push you down. And we would hear voices and growling sounds. The beds would shake by themselves. It would even, the master bed with Al and Carmen both on it, would even have a heartbeat that you could feel when you put your hands on it. Both the neighbor and Al also were being sexually attacked. I'll let Al explain what happened to him. I was froze. I couldn't move. And then I felt this stinging uh, penetration in, in my uh, anal area. And I, I was trying to scream, to cry out to Carmen to, to help me somehow. And uh, I couldn't move. Um, after. After a while, I don't know how long, uh, it, it, it had gone away, uh, there was no more sensation. Uh, I woke Carmen up and I said, Carmen, I, I think I was just sodomized by this demon. As you can see, this thing was incredibly powerful and terrifying. The one that attacked Al is known as a succubus. Those are demonic entities that attack men sexually. And as you can see from looking at Al, this is a real, you know, macho kind of guy. The last thing he wanted to do was admit that he had been raped. It took a lot of courage for him to come forth and tell us what was going on. We all started living together in the... Uh, living room. We were all sleeping there uh, for comfort, for strength, to try to help calm the fears. <laughs> there was one time, though, when it was a Saturday morning and we were all in our s sleeping bags and all of a sudden John Zaphis starts screaming <laughs> because he felt something clawing it's way up his leg. And he was terrified. Well, it turns out that the kids had let their two ferrets out of the cage that day and had gotten into the, uh, the sleeping bag with him. It, it definitely uh, was a nice break from the tension that we normally had to deal with. Um, but having said that, <clears throat> there was another night in August I was, it was the middle of the day. I had been up all night helping the family. 
and there was only one room in the house that had air conditioning it was hot and that was the room with the master bedroom now I wasn't gonna sleep in their bed because I just didn't feel comfortable doing that in someone else's bed so I was sleeping right on top of the, the coffin lift where the body would be brought, brought up from the basement and there was also a set of French doors that led down to the basement on the other side of the bedroom while I was asleep or half asleep I heard footsteps coming up the stairs I heard the French doors open I wanted to get up I wanted to know who that was and I couldn't move I truly was becoming afraid this entity I could hear it walking over to me and I knew it was standing right over me and in my head I am saying by the power of Jesus Christ I command you to be gone by the power of Jesus Christ I command you to be gone and I'm surrounding myself with the white light and I'm trying to cast off this force that's holding me down and it did break and of course there was nothing there afterward thank God on another occasion John was turning a corner and as he turned he came face to face with a gargoyle it unnerved him so much that he didn't come back for almost two weeks he really was spooked by that and I don't blame him the family was getting very very frustrated because the church wasn't willing to help and my grandparents had had some success in the past forcing the church to help by going public it's not something I recommend it's not something I would do myself but back then it was the only way to kind of push the church guilt the church if you will into taking action and so they did as you can see from all of these different headlines and we were on multiple TV shows and it got out of hand pretty fast on one night we had been interviewed for a program called a current affair and this was a Fox tabloid TV program you can actually find the interview on YouTube but just as it was about to air the transformer directly in front of the Southington house sparked and blew up right in front of me I was standing right there we had been outside Carmen was calling us inside to watch the program and then boom this thing went off like dynamite knocked out the power for over 1800 houses in Southington I actually only just saw that interview on YouTube this past week for the first time ever in 32 years so obviously and that was reported in the news as you can see obviously that made a, a, a lot of people start to wonder if there wasn't more to this than just crazy hysteria on September 6th the Archbishop of Hartford did okay a house cleansing the newspapers get it wrong they call it an exorcism but only people have exorcisms houses do not um, a couple of priests and deacons were brought into the house and they did a complete cleansing the chain hoist for lifting the, co the coffins was swinging wildly the house became frigidly cold and started to actually shake there was a statue of Mother Mary as you can see here and at the end of the ceremonies both hands on Mother Mary's statue were missing they moved within a month they couldn't wait to get out since that time Phil has had a complete recovery he's gone on to travel the world he's been married he's had children he's had a very good life and he's not schizophrenic Carmen has gone on to become a spiritual advisor you now sometimes these things happen to test your faith to strengthen your faith to help shape you into what God 
needs you to become. If you're going through trials of your own, if you're having problems with the paranormal, we're here for you. Please contact Warren Legacy Foundation at gmail.com and we're there for you. Our services cost nothing. We never expose you to the public and we will listen. God bless you and I look forward to talking to you again next time.